Hey, my name is Caleb Crabtree, and I'm so glad that you decided to click on this video. This is a message from our youth group this past Sunday night that we call Grace Student Night. I pray that God uses it specifically in your life to touch your heart and uh, to move you forward in faith. So enjoy it. Good, Paul. All right. What's up, guys? Hi. 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 For those of you that met me, uh, I'm one of our youth leaders here. My name is Alex. Uh, before I get into it, could you guys give Chan the man a hand again? He did a great job. <laughs> Chan the man. <clears throat> you did an awesome job, Chan. That's awesome. Uh, in this series, uh, we're going to be talking about the importance of having a good community around you. Uh, and as we go through this series, we just kind of want to talk about friendships are messy and it could seem overwhelming, but we want you guys to understand that the work is worth it. So as we go through this series, just remember that the work is worth it. So tonight, I'm going to start by talking about being a, being a friend means serving your friends. Some of the other messages you'll get to hear are the friends you'll choose will impact, impact the future you have. Being a friend means walking away friendly, and you'll also get to hear um, later on at our youth giving. Uh, just from some of our leaders, just on different biblical perspectives of what friendship really looks like uh, and everything like that. So let's jump into some prayer, and then I'll get into my message. Father God, thank you for today. God, thank you for everything you've blessed us with. God, I just pray you prepare the hearts and minds in this room. God, I just pray you fill me with your words and your spirit. God, whatever you have me say to these kids, I pray that you continue to let your spirit work through me. God, I just pray for a great time of fellowship after. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. So like I said, being a friend means serving your friends. It's the topic I'll be covering tonight. So in this day and age, we can really Google literally anything. Um, I know that being in college and stuff like that, YouTube University was how I got through school. I mean, you can Google anything you want right now, and you can find an answer. Uh, and one thing you can Google uh, is how to friend, but I, you never know what you're going to get when you Google those kind of things right now. Um, and the hard, th hard part about that is you can Google it, but it's not going to give you a good answer. Uh, because the friendships you have are not what you're going to see online. You're going to get some crazy answers, but you're not going to know how to specifically deal with certain people. You'll find some crazy answers, but you won't find about how to be a good friend. You'll see some generic things, but you won't find out how to be a good friend to a certain person. You also won't find how to make new friends. You might find some weird ways on the Internet to make new friends, but you might not find a way to find a specific friend you're looking for. You also won't find how to keep friends. Again, you'll find some things online, but you won't they won't be for that specific group of people you're looking for. You also won't find out if you're in a group of friends and it's not going well, how to change. No one really teaches you if you have friends and it's not going well, how to find new friends in that situation. Um, so we're going to go through just a couple things. I brought some pictures with me. Uh, growing up, I had some good friends. I, I can't say that it wasn't bad um, at all. I had some amazing friends. So if you want to put the first picture up. So here's some of my friends growing up. Uh, Growing up, like, we always did a lot together. There was always, there was never a time that we weren't doing something. Like, we got up from sunlight. We were out doing stuff. You could always figure out where we were because you could see all the bikes in one driveway. We were always doing something fun. There was always something to do. Um, I mean, we were, we'd go to practice. We'd come home, play Xbox. I mean, there was tons and tons of stuff to do. Um, so these are just some of the friends I grew up with. <coughs> go to the next one. Here's another friend that I have. <coughs> that's baby me. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, <coughs> no, but Sarah, I, uh, I got her to somehow be my friend in high school. Uh, I convinced her to do some fun stuff. So going up, growing up, we just became good friends, and she was always down to have fun. She was always there to support me. Um, she always got my SpongeBob references, so it was always a good friend to have. Uh, <laughs> if you go to the next one, um, I know a lot of people can't say this, but I'm very blessed that the people I grew up with, a lot of them, are still my good friends. Um, a lot of people are still in my life, whether they're here in Northeast Ohio or all, they're all over the country serving, serving our country. They're doing some crazy stuff. Um, and then here's my, here's my new friends that I have, too, my life group. Uh, they were just some of the leaders in here. I mean, we were just friends for a while, but they're family now, and it's amazing to see. And then uh, as some of you know, if you go to the next slide, I convinced Sarah somehow to be like a best friend forever, like a forever friend. 
<laughs> so I don't know how I did it. <clears throat> hey, y'all pray for Sarah, though. I don't feel bad for her. But there are people in here I know that you can't say that this has kind of been your story. I know you can't say that you had a lot of friends growing up, and that's just sometimes my story is, is unique. Not, not a lot of friends, people have friends that long. Um, some of you in here, I know that you had a friend group, and maybe they moved, or you moved to Northeast Ohio, and it's been tough. Because, I mean, I know growing up, and you have those relationships, and then all of a sudden you have to move because of your family. That might be your story. Or maybe you, have friend, you had friends, and as you got older, you started to grow apart. I mean, there's some people in that picture that I grew up with that we were best friends. We did everything together. And as we got older, we started growing apart. It's just part of life. Um, it's a hard thing to do. But um, those are just some things that you go through. And whatever spectrum you're on, having friends isn't easy. It's not just like I made those friends and everything was easy from then. Just remembering that we are all messed up, broken people. It's not easy. And if you don't think you're a messed up, broken person, you are more messed up and broken than you think you really are. Um, we all make mistakes. That is for sure. We are all going to make mistakes. Ask my wife. I make mistakes all the time. Uh, we all have bad days. We're going to have good. We're going to have bad. And when you have friends like that, they're going to see all those in-betweens between that. I mean, a lot of those friends I've actually, like, we've gotten fights before. Like, it's not like it's been easy sailing for that. But the point is that friendships are messy. No matter how long you've had them, how short they are, how genuine they are, they're always going to be messy. There's never a cure for something. And growing up, I wish there was a way that I could just Google, this is how you friend. I wish there was a way that you could just be taught that. I mean, growing up, we're taught how to be good kids, we're good, how to behave in school, but we're never really taught, like, if so-and-so does this, how do you be a good friend to them? Or so-and-so does this, how do we do this? A lot of times, we don't even have to make friends. I mean, your parents might have friends that are parents, and they just have kids your age, so you, by nature, become friends. Or you might just have friends on a, on a sports team, and you didn't have to go seek out those friends. So these are some of the things that we're not really taught growing up, and we're going to kind of look through as we go through these series. What I would like to do is I'd like to start in the New Testament and talk about one of Jesus' good friends. Uh, his name was John. He was <coughs> one of Jesus' good friends. He did a lot of life with Jesus. He, did, he shared all the highs and the lows of John's life. He got to laugh with him, cry with him, do all these things. And one of the stories I want to share is it was actually a pretty serious moment that John writes about uh, in his gospel. It, it takes part right before Jesus is actually sentenced to go to the cross. And... This is a moment where none of the disciples knew what was coming. Only Jesus knew. It's kind of like when you know something, someone tells you something, and you're the only person in the room that knows that, and you, you have that feeling. So, so just think about that feeling. And what Jesus does is he gathers all his friends and the ones he loves for one last meal. They don't know it is, but he knows that it's going to be one last meal with them. And I think one thing that where my mind went um, in that situation was, there's so many different things that I could have been thinking about knowing what was coming if I was in that situation. I would have been sitting at the, the table wondering, is my friend going to do this for me? Are they going to stand up for me? Are they going to do this for me? Or are they going to help me? Whatever it may be. But Jesus didn't do that when he sat there. Jesus wasn't worried about what his friends were going to do to him. He was wondering how he could serve his friends. He wasn't worried about how his friends were going to respond to him. He was worried about how, his, how he could help his friends. So he wasn't worried about that, so he took the first step. What I want you guys to see is instead of being reactive, Jesus was proactive with his friends. He didn't sit back and wait. He didn't sit back and hope that they would do certain things. He took the first step. So let's jump into our first section. John 13, 3, 5. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, that he had come from God, and he was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around them. So this may seem very random. Um, you guys are not wondering, why would he do this? If you think about the context of this story, back in the day, people walked a lot. And there were no shoes. There were no roads. I mean, it was some people were just walking on dusty, dusty roads. Um, as Pastor Michael would say, feet are nasty. They're, they're nasty. Um, and, and thinking about it like this, I mean, you guys, you guys have seen each other and smelled each other's feet. I mean, imagine being back in the day and having to deal with that. Um, but what to take away from this was when you went in there, this was a job done by the lowest person in the road, a low, a low servant. This wasn't a job that was done by someone like Jesus. This was something very different. And in this situation, it would, it would have made a lot more sense if the disciples would have washed Jesus' feet. 
in this count in this time in this culture this is what would have been the normal but here's what Jesus does he does the counter the, the countercultural thing that he always does he took the first step and he washed their feet what he's doing is he's showing that his upside and down kingdom what it really looks like what a practical application looks like Jesus demonstrated to the disciples what true friendship looks like he didn't wait he took the first step Jesus didn't wait on someone else to tell him what he wanted to do he served them he didn't wait for them to model what kind of friendship would look like. He took the first step. So he did this to show them what serving your friends truly looked like. Another person that did life with Jesus uh, that writes about it is uh, Dr. Luke. He talks about some of the encounters he had. And a piece of advice that he wrote down that's pretty simple but very practical is in Luke 6, verse 31. And as you wish that others would do to you, do the same to them. And as you wish that others do to you, do the same to them. In other words, when it comes to relationships, we need to be proactive as well. We need to stop waiting for our friends and hoping that they would treat us a certain way. And we need to start by serving them and being proactive and being the friend we want to be. And if we're going to be honest tonight, that's not easy. That's not an easy task. That's not what we want to do. There's so many times where we react to how people treat us. It's so easy to get in that mindset of waiting to see how so-and-so is going to be to us, and that's how we reciprocate the energy to them. We treat people the way they treat us. We respond how they make us feel. And sometimes that's just our first nature. That's just how we are. And I think sometimes it's hard to remember that if we don't spend time with God, that's going to always be our first response because that's how our flesh wants to respond. It's not something we can change inside of us unless, unless we let the spirit work through us and change it for us. I think in a practical example you could see is if, if you're in a group of friends and someone forgets to do something and invite you to something, you, and the next time there's a group event out of spite, You'll sit there and say, I'm not going to invite so-and-so because they forgot me last time or whatever it may be. It's simple things like that, and then it'll start to compound and create bigger issues between everybody. But if you really think about it, we can agree that that's not how we want our friendships to be. We don't want it to be a continued cycle of just trying to one-up each other. We don't want friendships to continue to just be something we have to do. We want our friends to value us. They, you want, we want our friends to include us. We want them to notice us. That we want them to be kind to us. And you want to feel important. You don't want to feel like you're just there because they felt like they had to invite you. You want to feel like you're important in that moment. And you want to make sure that you're not trying to always one-up each other in the sense of doing something better or doing something worse to each other. That's something we can always, we can always get in the, the mindset of. We want them to be patient and show us grace and forgiveness that we want. We expect that from everyone else, but we don't hand it out to anybody else. So that's one thing I want you guys to really think about when you're treating somebody a certain way. If that is something that they would do to you, why would you not do that to them? And I want you guys to remember that friendship should be uplifting, not exhausting. If you feel like you're always trying to pull and pull and pull, and the friendship just feels exhausting, there's got to be something that's not, not operating well, whether it's you or them or something. It should be uplifting, not exhausting. I want you guys to kind of think of it in some of the terms that you guys would, would see on your day-to-day. Before you text somebody, I want you guys to think about what if I texted people the way I would like to be texted back? What if I invite people to events or different things the way I would like to be invited, not out of spite or anger or feel like they have to? What if I would talk to others the other way I would like to be talked to? We talk about it all the time. It's not, a lot of it is not what you say, it's how you say it. It's not only just telling people certain things that you feel like you have to say, but it's the way you say it with intentionality. Also, when you think about it, if someone has wronged you or done something that's caused you hurt, what if I forgive people the way I would like to be forgiven? What if someone does something to you, and instead of holding a grudge, you forgive them and show them the love of Christ, so that way they can reciprocate that to someone else, and then you have a chain effect. And I think about it, too, especially in this day and age. What if I were to comment or post about people on social media in a way they would want me to? Because I think there's a lot of times where you guys are dealing with a lot of things on the Internet that a lot of us won't see. But re remembering that even though certain people can't see it, God still sees what you're doing and how you're doing it. And remembering that even though we can't, we can't see a lot of it, knowing that that person is on the other side of it, they're going to remember how you treated them. And remembering that if you leave a negative impact, it's gonna, they're going to do the same things for others. Uh, another thing I want you guys to think about is Jesus could have made all of his friendships about him. I mean, Jesus was the only person to ever walk this earth that was perfect. He could have told the disciples, he could have told everybody that I'm a perfect person, you you're not worthy to be around me. But even Jesus being the perfect person he was, he chose to serve first rather than to tell people what to do. He modeled that 
even though he was the perfect person and he could have orchestrated everybody to do everything for him, he took the first step and always served first. It's just a good reminder that, uh, even a reminder that we got a couple weeks ago in the main service was, we always have the opportunity to make the first move. It's a reminder that we always have a choice, no matter how people treat us, we always have a choice to treat them better than they treated us the first time. We always have that choice. So as we continue to roll through, we've been talking about serving your friends. One thing I wanted to point out to you guys is serving your friends doesn't mean giving what you have left over. It means giving of what you have sacrificially. Serving doesn't mean giving what you have left over. It means giving what you have sacrificially. And a lot of times people think of money when when we talk about sacrificially. And especially at your age, that's usually not what you guys are able to do. Giving sacrificially is also of your time, your resources, your presence. Just being in that moment when someone's going through something, remembering that it's not always about what you're doing and how you're doing it. It's just being there for somebody and serving them in a way that other people aren't serving them. So another person that did life uh, with Jesus was Mark. So another, another passage I'd like to look at is in Mark 2, verses 1 through 5. And it says, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathering together, so that there were no more in the room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get him near near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. When they had made an opening, they let him down, let down the bed on which the paralytic man lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. So the reason I bring this story up is a number of different reasons. So in this story, you have these four friends that have a, uh, a friend that's paralytic. He can't, he can't move. He can't do anything. Um, and they, they understand that Jesus is now in town, and they realize that Jesus is doing all these miracles and healing all these people. So they see an opportunity to take their friend there. And not only do they see this opportunity, but they see it as this could be life-changing, not only just for a little bit, but this could change the trajectory of their friend's life forever. But when they get there, they see that this room is jam-packed. They can't get in. Like, it, there's, it doesn't look good for them. So what I want you guys to see here is one thing I wanted to point out in the story was you have to know your friend's needs. I think a lot of times when we talk to our friends, we ask them, how are you doing or, or what's going on? And you, your friends just say, hey, I'm really struggling with this. And we say, okay, I'm going to pray. I'll, I'll pray for you. And it stops there. Like, you guys don't have conversations and, or I'll go through this. We just say, okay, I'll pray for you. But then we never actually pray for you, or we never actually take it any further. And I want to show you guys in the story that these friends knew that their their friend had no hope. So they they found a way to get him, get to Jesus. They found a way, and they knew the way that was only going to fix him. They knew that they needed to find the best doctor in town. Another thing I want you guys to see is you got to have commitment to your friends. I think the hard thing, too, is a lot of, especially in this day and age, you guys live one foot in the friendship and one foot outside the door. You're so, you're so ready to leave if something goes wrong or if there's one roadblock in the road, you give up on your friends or if something goes wrong. And I think if those friends would have got there, they could have showed up to the house and said, there's no way in here. There's literally, this room is jam-packed. There's nothing we could do. Let's just leave. But they were so committed to their friend that they literally thought of every possible opportunity. The guy was like, let's get on the roof and just take it off. And they were like, what? And he's like, yeah, I think it's good. And he's like, all right. So they, they literally got on the roof, ripped the roof off, and dropped their friend in. They could not have been more committed. And I want you guys to understand that just being friends and say, asking people how they are is not commitment. When you're actually asking somebody, it's spending time and actually helping them get to the solution that they actually need. Another thing I wanted, to see, wanted you guys to see in this story was not only what they were doing, but I want you guys to understand that you don't have to do it on your own. I think so many times when people read this story, they see that Their friends did all the work, but they forget that it was Jesus saying Jesus saw their faith. And just remembering that when you go into situations like this, so many times we think we can fix all of our friends' problems, but the real thing we need to do is just point them to Jesus and help them let Jesus fix their problems. Because there's so many times I see people that are giving all their opinions, and so many times they don't need our opinions. They need us to give them our prayers and and bring them to Jesus that will give them peace. And I think it's remembering that when, when their friend told them this, they didn't just say, here's what I learned on Facebook, and this is what the Facebook doctor said. They literally brought him to Jesus, which is the ultimate healer, and remembering that. What I want you guys to also see in the story, too, is Jesus is the ultimate friend in this, in this moment. Jesus not only 
healed the man, but what he did first was he forgave him and, and saved his soul. And everybody in that room, when he was dropped from the ceiling in front of Jesus, everyone in the room thought his most important need was his physical. Everybody thought that. Even he thought that. He thought that was the most important. But Jesus, being the true friend that he was, knew the actual need and knew that that spiritual healing was more important at that moment than the physical healing. So I want you guys to see when you go are going through something, there's going to be times where there's no one that's really going to know how to help you in situations. They're going to think they know how to help you, but deep down, only Jesus really knows how to fix that hurt you have or whatever it may be. So when you get in those situations, just remember that even though it may not make sense, Jesus will ultimately know what heals you and what to actually go to first. Just kind of circling back around, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about that sacrificial serving. And this is a conversation we have every once in a while. Just remembering that if what you're doing for your friends doesn't cost you anything, you aren't sacrificially serving them. And I think remembering, this is something we talk about too, is we think we're too busy to help people. We think we're too busy to be invested in people. And just remembering that when you sacrificially give something, it costs you something, whether it be your time, whether it be your resources, whatever you're giving, it takes something from you. And that is that is a way to be committed to your friend and realizing that um, it's just something that it's not easy to do, but once you do it, you realize the importance of how, how important it is to actually serve and sacrificially give to your friend. Sorry, I won't take up too, too much more time. Um, what we'll do as I start closing the message, I just want to talk to you guys about um, – there's, three, there's a couple of different things you can we could talk about here, and I think it's just remembering that if you're having trouble with friends, sometimes it could be that you're the problem. In this situation we've been talking about the last couple of weeks is you will reap what you sow. And I think remembering that if all your friendships right now are filled with strife and envy and anger and bitterness, and that's all you're sowing right now, Later on in life when you're going through something or that you need that true friend or you want to be better friends, you're going to harvest all those feelings of bitterness and sorrow because that's all you're, you're sowing right now. And I think it's remembering, too, if you're on the flip side, if, you have, if you're sowing that gentleness, that kindness, you're going to harvest those fruits of the spirit we've been talking about these last couple weeks in the last series. And just a reminder that sometimes we think that something we're doing is so minimal but there's a lot of times where you do something so small and consistently, over time it's going to make a huge impact on somebody's life. And I think it's, if we get to a spot where we feel, even if we do this little thing, it's going to be insignificant and not important. But remembering that if you do that over time, it's going to grow into something extremely large. I think another, another place you guys could land on right now is you've done all the things you can think of to be a good friend. You've talked to people, you've gone through all the motions, you've prayed about it, and you feel like you're doing all you can to be a good friend. And something I want you guys to realize is sometimes you may not be the problem, it's the people you're hanging out with. Maybe you need better friends. Maybe the problem isn't, isn't what you're doing, it's your friends. An analogy I heard once was, um, it was of a water bottle. So this water bottle, at certain events, people give these out for free. You could go to the grocery store, and this could cost a dollar. You could go to, like, the gym. It costs, like, $2. You could go to the movies. It costs, like, $3, $4. You could go to a sporting event. It's, like, $6, $7. What I want you guys to see is nothing changed about this water bottle. It's the same water. It's the same brand, same everything. The only thing that changed its value is the place it's in. I want you guys to realize that maybe you're hanging out with friends that would give your friendship away for free. They could care less about it. Maybe you're hanging out with some friends that kind of value this. But maybe you need to find friends that value you so much that they're willing to pay anything to be your friend. And I think you, what you realize is you're not the problem per se. Maybe it's the people that are hanging out with you that don't value who you are and what you bring to the table. So don't forget that as you go through that. So as I start to wrap this message up, um, the last slide I have on here, can you bring that up, Brake Girl? So as we talked about, <laughs> it might seem like it's a big task to serve your friends. It might seem like you have to give everything up, you have to spend every second of your day serving your friends. And I don't want you guys to miss that the little things every day make a huge difference in somebody's life. So what I want you guys to do um, as you go is if you pull out your phone and write this down, I think everybody in, everybody in their friendship, in their life, they can think about one person that's struggling with something and one way they can serve them. What I want you guys to do is if you write this down, 
every day when you wake up, if you put it as your lock screen, if you put it somewhere, you'll see it. I want you guys to just look at it. And I'm guilty of this too. Is if something's not right in front of me, sometimes I forget about what's, what's really going on. And I think if you guys write one thing down and one person down, you will find out that you'll be able to make a huge difference in their life. And if you make a difference in their life, they're going to notice that difference, and then they're going to go make a difference in someone else's life, and it's going to change from there. So I want you guys to see is it's not – you don't have to make a miraculous change all day, every day in someone's life. It's a little thing here and there that's going to make a huge difference. And that's what Jesus modeled for his friends in their walk each and every day. Well, hey, I hope you enjoyed the message. I hope that God used it specifically in your life. Uh, regardless of what you're going through, I, I pray that he used it in your life. We would love for you to join us in person at Grace Student Night, Sunday nights from 6 to 9 p.m. See ya.